Uh, but he did also something very interesting that is not known to everybody because when you see this drawing on the left, you think that he, Ramonica Hart, saw all these neurons together simultaneously, but he did not. Actually, he took one cell, he reconstructed it, then he put it aside to another cell and near and a third cell, and then he put an axon coming from the thalamus near that. So all this is a composition. It's, it's an artistic composition because he never saw all of them together. He just saw here and there and here and there, and he composed a circuit, this time an atom, so to speak, on a paper. But this is, this is really his attempt to understand how the circuit is composed anatomically by seeing one after the one uh, unit or ingredient of this network. Of course, he did not know at that time about the connectivity. He thought that there must be connections, and so he had this theory of dynamic polarization and so on, but he did not see all these details, which we do see today because of these technologies like EM and other microscope and so on. So, but he was the one to really start to reconstruct the brain. That's how I see it. By the way, if you look back on my screen, this is a real building that I'm sitting in, not right now, but uh, my office is there. And this building is that you can see before, be, behind me in Jerusalem, the new, our new center is really built from neurons. So the whole facade around the building, which is huge, the six meter high, these are neurons, some of them reconstructed by Ramon y Cajal, but now on our building. So Ramon y Cajal is there all the time, you see, on my building. So when I look from my window, I see dendrites and different cell types and so on. So you can enjoy the building when you come to visit Jerusalem. He was also very poetic, as you know. Of course, his, uh, his term of, of neurons to, to be the butterflies of the soul. I wish we could write today. I wish I could be so poetic, but I think maybe the editors will reject my paper if I will start to call neurons butterflies of the soul. But this is, of course, the way to think about science because it's an artistic endeavor, not only intellectual one. It's an artistic endeavor. And of course, Ramon y Cajal was also a painter in addition to being a great thinker. I really have a big adoration to this fellow, no question about that. So wh what do you want to do today? So, so we want to reconstruct the brain as well, like he did, but in this, this time we want to, to preserve it digitally. So it will not only appear on a, on a paper, but it will be preserved on the computer digitally after I reconstruct a cell or a network and I can preserve it forever. So everybody can use it in the future, download it and use you know, the circuit that we built. I can also use today Ramon y Cajal, but more visually, but now we can do it digitally and it's, it's available. But not only that, as I will show you in a second, we want to use the circuit that we built digitally to add onto, on top of the anatomy, to add dynamics, to add activity. And this is a big challenge, as I will explain in a second, because you want to take different information, types of information. So anatomical information is of course essential because you need to have the roadmap of the brain, the connectivity of the brain, who is talking to who, but how do they talk to each other? Who says the plus, you know, excitatory and who is in the inhibitory? How does the network interact dynamically while I'm talking now, while I'm thinking and so on? This is something that you cannot do just by anatomy on a paper. You need a system that enables you to run dynamically. And for this, you need mathematical equations that will describe the dynamics of neurons, synapses, and the network as a whole. And we believe, as I will show you, that by doing that, we will get deep new understandings that you cannot get by just doing either anatomy or physiology, not connecting them together. And I don't know of any other method to connect things rather by a computer. You can connect them in your thinking or in your mathematical equations, but it's much, much too complicated with too many ingredients. You need some tool to integrate information from genes to network, from genes to behavior. So I want to, I want to start uh, with a question because it's not so clear to many of the people, at least in the street, when I meet people and tell them that I'm simulating the brain, I'm building a brain in the computer, they ask me the same question that this girl that you see on the left, top, uh, uh, lower left here, AB, 11 years old girl, who was my 
reviewer for a paper that I wrote to this journal, which I like a lot, and I'm actually one of the editors of Frontiers for Young Minds. You really should look at Frontiers for Young Minds. It's an open access journal by Frontiers, a series of journals. And so we wrote with Felix, who is the Blue Brain Project, uh, one of the Blue Brain Project managers, that uh, we want to simulate the brain. We have big uh, projects and we want to simulate. We, there is a lot of data. And she asked me as a reviewer, she, re she rejected my paper. The girl rejected my paper. She said, Professor Segev, with all respect, there is already a brain. Why do you need to copy it? It already exists. So why do you need to copy something that exists? You didn't explain it well. You didn't explain it well. You take this, you take this, you put a copy, but how, how can a copy explain something that the original cannot? That's a very, very good question, of course. And so this girl really helped me to rewrite the paper and Felix together to make it more clear, why do we simulate the brain? So I'm now responding to the girl when I talk to you. Okay, so as I said, the attempt is really to take many levels of descriptions from genes to, 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 to proteins and, and to receptors and to spines, to nerve cells and synapses and to go up with one tool together. So I can eventually connect what happens when I manipulate, let's say a gene to the top level of behavior. So when I speak about behavior, I can show you Picasso, Pablo Picasso, Pablo Picasso drawing, this is a behavior. So Picasso also had, you know, neurons and synapses and circuits and networks and brain regions, and he behaved. He behaved beautifully, you know, this is another one, Spaniard, absolute genius, probably the most, the, the most genius painter of the 20th century. But anyway, this is a behavior, so I want to connect genes to behavior and I want to understand the whole. And to do that, I cannot avoid but, but, but connecting things. So, so how do I connect things? That's the idea. How, how do I connect things via the computer? So here is what we do. So we take cell by cell, reconstructed by Javier de Felipe in, in, uh, in Madrid, in Cajal Institute, by Henry Markram here and there and so on, Many, many people reconstruct neurons and they are already digitized in the network, in, in, the, in the computer, somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the cloud. But we want to integrate them into a circuit. And for this, of course, we need a lot of information about who is talking to you, who, how many connections there are between one cell here to another cell there. But in the last uh, 10 years, we did a lot of work. And about two years ago or three years ago, we succeeded to reconstruct full cubic micrometer, a millimeter, about 100,000 cells in a cubic millimeter of the mouse brain or the rat brain in this case. So we have this connectivity anatomy, an anatomy now digitized in the computer. And on top of it now, as I said, we need to add activity. Of course, you can ask me, you are right. How do you know that this is the exact anatomy? Because you take one cell from here, another cell from there, like Ramon Cajal did. He took one cell from this animal, another cell from another animal and put them together. So of course we have still way to go and you may know there is this connectomic project uh, that Javier de Felipe and his team uh, is working on, you know, doing EM, electron microscope reconstruction, then you know synapse by synapse, connection by connection and so on. So this is not built on that, it's a statistical network, it's an average network of a cubic millimeter with about, uh, as I said, 100,000 cells. Uh, we know today, Ramon y Cajal already saw it, but now we know that there are many, many subtypes of cell types in the brain. So many types of trees. There is not only one pyramidal cell type. There are many pyramidal cell types and inhibitory cell types. It's a complicated jungle in terms of trees. And apparently, and I don't know if you know, but there is a big, big project started in the world. It's called the Cell Census Project. Very big project by NIH, the American NIH because they want to really characterize genetically how many cell types there is in the brain, maybe several thousand types. And each type is apparently important for a specific function, especially in diseases. You know, when one type of cell dies, you can see a, 
an appearance of a disease, let's say like Parkinson in the case of dopaminergic cells. So cell types is also a very important thing. And we want also to incorporate this information because eventually we want a circuit that if this circuit becomes sick in the computer, if a certain cell type is abolished in the circuit, then there should be some disease emerging, let's say Parkinson or Alzheimer or something like that. So we need to reconstruct not only the anatomy gross, but also take into account the units which are different from each other. And of course, we want to take the electrical activity, as I said, and the electrical activity sounds like this. Okay, so you know, all you know that each cell has its own characteristic firing of spikes so they, they are talking electrically in addition to being an atomical entity. And, and, and each cell, you know, we have also types of electrical activity. So some cells fire like this, sorry. Some cells fire like this one, ta 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 ta, -ta very regularly. Some cells fire with adaptation, ta 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 ta, slower. Some cells are stutterers, ta 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 ta, stop, ta 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 ta, stop. So these cells are not only anatomically different, but also physiologically different. And the whole activity of the brain depends also on the fact that each cell is not, not talking the same, so to speak, language. Yeah? So it's a big philharmonic of many, many, many instruments. Let's say in the cortex, we think that there are something on the order of 100 different types of morphological cells. And on top of it, these instruments, which look different like a violin or cello, they also have different activity. So this is a philharmonic of activity and we are trying to understand the whole philharmonic, the whole music that is coming from all these instruments. So in order to do this, you need mathematics. You need to integrate what you know about physics of neurons. So, you know, membrane channels and ion activity that go through, so electrical activity. So you write equation, these are the Hodgkin-Huxley well-known 52 equations, and you also use other equations to describe the, pro the propagation of a signal along the tree, along the dendritic tree. So these are the cable equations by role. So you have to integrate all this information in, in, by, by, to represent a neuron mathematically in the computer. So when I say simulate, when I, I talk about the word simulate the neuron, simulate the synapse, I mean that I write mathematical equations whereby the solution of the equation looks like the actual activity, the chemical or electrical activity that I'm trying to simulate. So this is an example. So here is an experiment in brown. This is electrical activity from a particular cell that fires spikes following a given stimulus. So tuck, 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 brown spikes. And when we model it mathematically, if we do it correctly, then the computer solution in green will fire spikes very similar to the spikes of the biological neuron. So this is simulation using expanded Hodgkin-Huxley equation to describe the electrical activity of this neuron and then of another type of neuron and then of the synapse and then you can connect all of them. So you put a mathematical equation for each neuron one by one, one by one. This is done together with the EPFL Blue Brain Project and now we can have a full circuit that is not only anatomical, approximately correct, but also physiologically. And then we can look at the philharmonic activity. We can look at the music of the generates by the whole thing. Okay, this is extremely difficult to do, of course, physiologically. Although today we have tools to record from thousands of cells simultaneously, but we certainly cannot record from individual cells when we talk about million or, or many, many million of cells, but today we can do it in the computer, but also manipulate specific parameters, which is also very hard physiologically. Let's say I can shut off a synapse, I can kill in the computer a specific type of cell and see how the activity changes when I manipulate the circuit. So going back to the girl at, 11, at the age of 11 who told me you didn't explain why you should do a copy, the answer is that I can not record. I, I don't have the tools to record a big, a big, at the level of synapses and neuron. I don't have the tools, although I develop new tools, but also I don't have the way to manipulate parameters individually to understand diseases. 
I don't know how to, 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 to kill a specific cell type or, or to manipulate the strength of specific synapse and see what happens in Parkinson and so on. But I can do it in the computer. So this is a very strong tool that helps me to replicate something biological by a mathematical equation and then study it and then go back to the biology. So it's a ping pong, it's a game between the computer simulation, which, which is close to reality, and then go back to reality to examine some of the predictions that my simulation is doing. So simulations of a heart, of a kidney, of a brain, is very, very important tool to understand the origin that I'm trying to understand, in this case, the brain. Just to tell you that today we can now simulate in the computer because we have much bigger computers and we de develop much faster algorithm to simulate this huge number of equations. You understand that each cell has something on the order of, let's say, 10,000 equations per cell, and you have huge amount of cells, in this case, 200,000 neurons. So it's big, big set of equations that the computer, supercomputer in Lugano must, must solve. So this is just showing you that the network in the computer starts to behave. This is spontaneous activity of the network in the computer. Sometimes it becomes epileptic and sometimes it becomes a Parkinsonian. So we are trying to understand these dynamics using, using this computer. But today we also can, we just recently succeeded to simulate a whole cortex, 10 million cells and about 100 billion synapses in the computer. So here you see uh, the, 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 the neocortex of a rat with all its cell types and connections and synapses and so on. And here you can see that we are starting to connect in the left. You can see that we are starting to build, you know, the corpus callosum, axons connecting one hemisphere to another hemisphere. We are trying to build a whole brain. So we are now at the level of a whole cortex. But we also succeeded to re re reconstruct a full hippocampus. So this is another region of the brain, which is very important for memory, as you know. So this is the full reconstruction of a mouse hippocampus. And so we are, we are slowly, slowly developing. Soon we are going to complete the, the you know, cerebellum and so on, that eventually we shall connect it all to have a whole rat mouse, a rat brain. So this will be a mouse or a rat brain. And we are getting, we are starting to connect the virtual mouse this is a virtual mouse. You touch the whiskers, virtually you touch the whiskers, but this touch is connected through the equations into the circuit that I just mentioned. So we are trying now to understand better the mapping between whisker activity to the activity of the simulated brain. So we are trying to connect the environment because after all the brain is meaningless, so to speak, if it doesn't get input from the senses in this case, the whisker system, but we want, also, of course, to build an avatar with eyes, an avatar with no nose, and so eventually this, this circuit will be part of the environment, so to speak, of the body, the body and the environment of the animal. But we are not there yet, just to tell you where we are heading. Okay, so now that I hope that I succeeded to convince you why do we do simulations, what are we trying to do? I want to show you two results two interesting results that came about recently using the circuit. You, you may know that our brain has this uh, capability to be surprised. So when I'm doing something like that, and I'm recording from the auditory cortex of a mouse, and I'm giving it something like that. I don't know if you can hear, but it's something like ta 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 So this is an auditory stimulus. And there is something that is the standard, the blue, this frequency blue, ta, 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 okay? And when you record from the brain of an animal, you can see that the animal responds electrically very strong to the deviant, to the surprise. You all know that you are surprised, you know, when there is something that is unusual. You expect something regular, ta, 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 and suddenly I say ta. So what is the origin of the surprise? What happens in your brain when you are surprised? So this is a very classical experiment, set of experiments done in many, many labs. It's called stimulus specific adaptation. It doesn't matter if I'm taking this frequency as, as a standard or the other frequencies. So I can do 
you know, the low frequency as a standard, ta, 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 ta. It doesn't matter which one is the surprise, the brain always responds very strong to the surprise. The network in the auditory cortex responds very strong to the surprise. So what is the, what is the mechanism of surprise in the brain or, or the auditory surprise? The, the stimulus-specific adaptation. And this is what happens in the experiment. You can see that, that there is a very strong electrical response. This is now experimental results. You can see there is a very strong electrical uh, response both at the level of single neuron or a level of local field potential when you record from the whole auditory cortex, there is a very strong response to the surprise, to the rare stimulus. And it doesn't matter if the rare stimulus is this one or is this one, it's always bigger than the standards. So what is the origin of this? I think there are about 100 papers, if not more, written about this stimulus-specific adaptation. The origin, the origin, the mechanism of stimulus-specific adaptation. And, every, and now there is a consensus in the literature that this phenomena, which is called synaptic depression phenomena, is the origin of, of, of this surprise response. Why? Because, you know, synapses, synapses excitatory synapses between, uh, between uh, cells in the cortex tend to, to decay if you stimulate them repeatedly. So, tac, 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 tac and the EPSP, the synaptic response, become, you know, weakened, becomes depressed. This is called short-term depression. So this depression, people believe, underlies the this, this surprise response in the brain. How do they know it? They cannot record, you know, the synapses while the animal behaves, but mathematical models show that if you put this into the model, abstract model, then, of course, when you stimulate with a standard tone, ta, 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 then the synapse becomes fatigued, becomes depressed. But then when there is something new, a new sound, ta, then the synapses that, re that reflect this new sound are not depressed and they respond stronger. So you should expect depression of a repeated stimulus and a strong response to a rare stimulus. But is it true? Is it true? So here is what we did with the circuit, and you can see the usefulness of a circuit. First of all, we asked, so this is a circuit that we use. In this case, it's a cubic millimeter or a third of a cubic millimeter. Let's call it a column, cortical column. Let's say auditory cortical column in the cortex of, in the, of the mouse. So this is the circuit. And we can now stimulate the circuit with axons coming from the thalamus, from the auditory thalamus. So this axon, the blue axon here, let's say, respond with a frequency, let's say, of 6,000 hertz. The red axon responds with a frequency of 9,000 hertz. And we know that the thalamus, this is the thalamus here below, has a tonotopic or a arrangement. So to the left, there are axons climbing to the cortex that responds with a low frequency. This is high frequency. So we can now simulate a response, you know, the SSA, the stimulus-specific adaptation, by giving the circuit ta, 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 ta. So I will give the circuit 6,000, 6,000, 6,000, 6,000 hertz, 9,000. Or 9,000 hertz, 9,000 hertz, 9,000, 6,000. 6, so what we did is we mapped by axonal, this mathematical mapping, from the thalamus here to the cortex in the circuit. Okay, and of course, we simulate each neuron correctly in the thalamus and so on. So we replicate this experiment and we ask a simple question. Do we see in the, in the simulated circuit, without planning it, do we see surprise response? To our happiness, and this is now simulation, we didn't plan it in advance. We didn't plan it. We didn't think, we didn't build the circuit. When we build the circuit in the blue brain, we didn't plan that it will respond to auditory stimulus in any way. We just build it with synapses, with spikes, with neurons. And all. We didn't plan that it will become stimulus-specific adaptation circuit. So you can see that the deviant, this is red, the deviant response, both in a single cell and also in the whole circuit, is always bigger. The deviant is always bigger response than the standard. So we, this circuit is also surprised 
by a rare stimulus, which is very good. So it's a universal, because we didn't plan it, it's a universal phenomena of cortical circuits. This is not an auditory circuit. It was not built to simulate auditory circuit at all. It's actually somatosensory circuit, but we can discuss it later. So now we can do something that cannot be done physiologically. So, oops. so this is a response of the circuit when it's normal. You can see there is a measure, it's called, this, that doesn't matter, there is a measure showing that there is strong response. If, if there was no something strong response to the deviant, everything would be around zero. But you can see that some of the cells, especially in layer four and layer five, responds very strongly to the deviant. So this is some kind of a measure uh, of response to deviant. And this is with a the synaptic depression that exists in the circuit. Just by building it, there is synaptic depression because we replicate synaptic depression because we found synaptic depression. But what happens when I block synaptic depression in the circuit? Instead of, of synapses have, being like that, we make all the synapses like this, not depressing. This is something you cannot do experimentally. We don't have a tool to transform a synapse from being depressed to being not depressed. And you can see still there is spike stimulus adaptation. So synaptic depression does play a role in this phenomena because you can see this is stronger than here, but still you can see here, there is still a surprise response. And this is the beauty of the circuit. So because now I can see, I can look for the mechanism of the surprise response in the circuit in the computer. And we found that there is another mechanism. It is called spike frequency adaptation, which is the adaptation of the spiking activity, not of the synapse, but of the spiking activity. And when you block this in the circuit, there is no surprise response anymore. So we use the circuit to uncover another mechanism. I'm not going to tell you about that, but just to show you that when I build a circuit and a phenomena emerge, then I can manipulate anything I want because I build the circuit and I can ask questions about what is the origin of this response. Okay, I also want to show you very briefly, as I said, I started 10 minutes later. So I just very briefly to show you that there is another thing that we are doing that is very, very hard to do uh, otherwise is to try to understand whether this circuit in the cortex is a random circuit. On average, it, it is connected randomly to each other or is there some kind of structure already innate, built in into the circuit? Is it a jungle or is it a, a, a structured circuit? I don't know if you know, but there is a beautiful work just to show you that I, I, I'm sure you know the work of Jason Pollock. You know, action painting, as it is called action painting. And this is one of his, uh, I think, beautiful uh, and very, very expensive uh, paintings. So, you know, he did it spontaneously. It looks like random painting. You know, he threw paint, he threw paint on the canvas again and again and again. Is it random? Is it random? There is a beautiful recent paper in Frontiers by a group of mathematicians showing that there is a very, very, very prominent structure because after all he is moving and movement is not random. So this painting reflects structure of the, of the brain of the activity, of the, of the muscle activity of, of Jason Polo. Anyway, so that's what we are trying to do, to find whether there is some kind of a structure in the circuit we built. Experimentally, in the last several years, people show that when you record, when you record from, when you record here, this is from the EPFL here, from Henry Markham, and this is from another group, when you record multiple cells in the cortex, you see that they tend to be connected much more, sometimes much more than expected randomly. They generate what is called motifs. So you can see this kind of a motif, yes, that cell A connected to cell B and so forth like this, much more than expected by a random network. What is the origin of these motifs? What, what, what is the origin of these motifs? To our surprise, we found that also when we look at motifs in our circuit, and then I said we build it cell by cell, cell by cell, and connected them together with some rule, we also get motifs, overexpressed motifs, as in the experiments. Why our circuit that we build from pieces by pieces generate a structure? What is the origin for that? So because I don't have time, I just want to tell you 
by doing mathematical analysis of our circuit, this time using an atomical analysis, using topology, graph theory, we found that the origin of these motifs, the fact that you have motifs, these triplet motifs overexpressed like those two or like those two, both in the, in the reconstructed circuit, but also in the cortex itself from the experiments, is due to a very, very simple result that I'm jumping. It, it is due to the fact that neurons are not spherical. If the neuron was completely spherical and the axon would go uniformly to all directions, then you would expect a random network, unless you have some rule for connectivity, genetic rule, that tells you you connect up and you don't connect down. But we don't need any genetic rule. Just the fact that you have a structure to, neur to a neuron that is not uniform in space, so dendrites go upward and axon goes like this and so on, then of course, if the axon goes downward, there is a good chance to get a connection from top to bottom just because of the asymmetry of individual neurons. And we can explain completely, absolutely completely, this structure of the network based on the structure of individual neurons. So the more anisotropic the neuron is, the more non-uniform the structure of the neuron, the more specific types of motifs emerge. So this is a surprise for us that a single neuron structure dictates the structure of the network to a large extent. Of course, there is plasticity. You can learn, so you can move synapses from here to there. But there is already, to my understanding, there is already innate, you are born with a structure in your cortex, this motif structure, and then you can refine it by plasticity, but you cannot change the gross structure, which is this motif structure, no matter what you do. And we also validated experimentally. We went to reconstruct, this is a work of uh, Henry Markham and Perrin from their lab. They reconstruct, they, they measured for many, 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 12 neurons together, and they really indeed found that if you know the location of neuron one, neuron two, which one is above the other, which one is below the other, then you can predict the motifs just by the location, the 3D location of the neurons. This means that the structure and location of neurons dictates to a large extent the emergence of network structure. This came from analyzing the circuit that we built. I don't think that we could find this understanding or get this understanding without reconstructing the circuit. So that's what I wanted to say just to end by saying that building a circuit, building a detailed circuit enable us to uncover structural principles. For example, I can ask how many synapses on the average between any one cell to any another cell there is in the cortex. So if you take two cells in a cubic millimeter, how many synapses what is the shortest pass between these two neurons? It's 2.5 synapses. This is very hard to know. If you don't reconstruct it, you can reconstruct it with EM and count the distance. We are waiting for EM, full cubic millimeter EM from Javier and from Lichtman and from Helmstatter, and we shall get this information, but this is prediction. And you can get these motifs and you can get these hub neurons and, and all this kind of thing I didn't have time to talk to you about. Finally, just to tell you about the future, the future is really to go beyond the mouse, beyond the rodents. I think the world realized that we can understand rodents as much as we want, but there are very strong differences, especially in medication. We need to understand circuits from human brain. And we started to collaborate both with Javier here in Cajal Institute and Ruth and all this group there and with the Koch in Amsterdam and there are about 10 groups today that are working on single human neurons from post-operation. So these are living neurons from tissue taken from post-operation, you know, tumor or epileptic seizures, and you can reconstruct neurons. You can start to understand the connectivity between neurons. So our next project, which will take several good years, is to reconstruct a piece of human brain in the computer rather than the rodent brain and compare and understand what makes us human? What is so unique about us that I can talk to you in a Zoom and the mouse is not so good in talking to you in the Zoom, at least as much as I know about mouses. But this is really taking details from Javier de Felipe reconstruction, which are really beautiful. This is human layer two, three, post-mortem. 
in this case post-mortem, not alive, and we are doing this direction. Another direction, we are using the circuit now, we are trying to use the circuit, the reconstructed simulated circuit, to teach it, to teach the circuit by manipulating synaptic strength to drive an avatar car. We get a very good success in teaching a circuit to drive a car by closing the loop between the environment and the circuit. So this is another direction, an AI attempt to use the circuit to drive cars. And finally, we are now very excited to be able to use machine learning techniques to show that a single individual neuron, a cortical layer five neuron in this case, cannot be replicated by unless by, by, by deep networks, by deep neural networks, you know, this is a big buzz, big hype. If you want to replicate the input output of individual neuron, you need at least seven layers, hidden layers, to replicate spike by spike, the input spikes to output spikes. You cannot do it by a point neuron, by one point neuron. And as you know, deep neural networks today are using one single node, as they call it, a neuron, a node. And this node receives all the synapses at one point. The brain doesn't do it. The brain receives the synapses on dendrites and the dendrites are nonlinear. There are NMDA spikes and calcium spike and all these things. In, and this forces the network to be deeper because the individual unit is deep. So we are now trying to build deep neural networks inspired by the complexity of single neurons. So here it is, we are already trying to compute using deep network to replicate Purkinje cell in this case, to, you know, to classify faces. So we, are, we think that the brain is much stronger due to the fact that the, already the unit is functionally deep. I want to thank all my students. Of course, without them, nothing that I could tell you now, I could, I would, I will not be able to do it. So this is a teamwork, not only with them, but also internationally, as I mentioned. And I want also to thank all of you for the 100 years of Ramon Cajal Institute. Great institute, wonderful work, good collaboration. If we shall continue to interact, we'll do great things. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Eden, for this, uh, for sharing with us this uh, fascinating, uh, this fascinating work. Um, so it's now time for the audience to participate in the discussion. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you have the question and answer tool below, and uh, uh, you can also raise your hands, and I will allow you. I will open your your microphone. So in the time that you get the system to, uh, to, um, to, to make it work. Uh, I, I would like to make you a question, uh, uh, even if, if you don't want. I, I'm very naive with these uh, models, but I, I wonder that for what you need to, to put into, into you, in, your, in your models are discrete classes of neurons, okay? And I have the impression that the, now, nowadays, uh, in particular, out of this uh, transcriptomic analysis, uh, we are um, realizing that maybe uh, neuronal diversity is, non is not made of discrete classes, but rather a continuum. I was wondering how this will fit in your model and if, if you can really implement this kind of, uh, let's say, um, diversity in it. That's a very good question. So I'm actually, I, I mentioned this cell census and we actually got a big grant, a $20 million grant from the NIH to do cell census of human neurons. This is together with the Allen Institute, Ed Lane in the Allen Institute. These are molecular biology people, but all the analysis, you know, is done there and here and so forth. We are trying to do this, what is called the triplet, the triplet characterization of neurons. So connect the morphology of a neuron, physiology of uh, electrical activity of a neuron and the transcriptomic of a neuron. So these are three aspects. And of course, the genes are dictating to a large extent also the morphology and also the channel, the physiology. So this is a very, very interesting work. It's actually paper now under review. I can actually send you, it just appeared a week ago, we just sent it to BioArchive, this paper on combination of genes, electrical activity and morphology. So there you, you can see unique cell types in human brain. And yes, a lot of diversity. 
still there are tra it depends of course on how do you characterize where do you find the threshold to call it a, a, a one cell and then yeah, exactly. another cell mm -hmm. but but i just so so it's a matter of decision but it really looks that there are for example inhibitory cells of course and excitatory cells very clear and within this there are this distinct type of uh, chandelier cells and so on but it's a continuum you're right and in the model I should have mentioned that when you take a cell, of course, we have reconstructed a limited number of cell types, and then you have to replicate them in order to build a circuit of 10 million cells. We don't have 10 million cell reconstructed. So what we decided to do is not to take a copy of each cell and replicate it, let's say 10,000 times the same cell, but each time we replicate it, we do a little bit of noise. So it's not exactly the same morphology, it's not exactly the same physiology in the model. In the model, you do a little bit of noise because we know that each cell is a little different from another cell, although it looks similar, it's not identical. So this, this variability is already into the model. I see. Mm -hmm. Both electrically and physiologically, they are never one copy of another. They are close, they are family, they are layer five pyramidal cells, but they are not exactly the same. What does it do to the computation? Is it important to the dynamics when, it, when it's identical versus va variable? This we don't know yet, if it is important functionally. Or is it just a biological noise? I see. Okay, this is way more naturalistic, of course. We have a couple of questions on the, on the, uh, on the uh, tool. I don't know if you, if you can see them, uh, Aidan. I can read it for you if you want. Uh, you can see it, it now. This okay. is by Irene. Is, am I writing the Irene? The, the Irene Gonzalez, yeah. <coughs> Similar to the mismatch negativity response, this is alter schizophrenia. This is a surprise response, also alter psychiatric disease and schizophrenia. If so, <laughs> that's a good question. So, as you said, as I said, Irene, I said in the beginning that one of the, of the biggest attempt or biggest reason for us to build the circuit is to understand diseases. Yes, what, why, why schizophrenic or autistic people, what happens to the synapses or to the connectivity or to the electrical activity of diseased people or animals that they function as a whole differently than let's say, let's call it normal, whatever normal means. So yes, uh, so, so you are right that the SSA is very similar to the mismatch negativity, it's not the same. And there are some diseases, for example, autistic diseases and so on that do not respond autistic people do not respond to differences in sound like uh, like a human. Uh, we don't know the origin yet. There is some theories actually by Henry Markram. I don't know if you know this, this very interesting work on the synapses of an autistic mouse. It's called the intense world theory, the intense world theory. The, the synaptic intensity, the synaptic connectivity are stronger in autistic mouse and that's the reason why they tend to retract, they cannot bear this very strong activity. But yes, I don't have an answer to this specific question, but I'm saying that our, we are building circuits to make them sick, the circuit, and understand the origin of sickness by manipulating certain parameters. We are not there yet, but we have the tool now. So that's one question for Thank any you. question. How about the glials? Ah, <laughs> very good. So yeah, you, you caught me because our building from the back and also the circuit I showed you is also neurons and of course uh, you will hear today also you know 50% maybe more sometimes are glia cells of different types and there is a whole big team of about 20 people in the blue brain that are reconstructing and adding glia cells and interaction between glia cells blood oxygen into the circuit so that the circuit will become alive using these glia cells which are essential for memory and for maintenance but they are not in my circuit yet because we believe that most of the activity electrical activity the direct electrical activity is really relying mostly on, on on neurons but of course you cannot ignore absolutely not today glia cells you will hear about that uh, later on okay and then we we have question we have time excuse me for uh, for one more question uh, there are a few pending on the on the uh, on so the, you, want to, uh, you want to choose or what? what, what no, no, no. Go, go ahead in order, I guess. Uh, in order, in order. So where we are. Uh, so, okay. Josue so, Garcia Yahweh is asking if it's possible to simulate different brain states in your model. For absolutely, example, yes. Test. Yeah. absolutely, yes. So, yes, it's a very good question, you know, because let's say the cortex or, 
or the thalamus becomes, the activity becomes different when you, let's say, sleep, different sleep states. And yes, so whenever, for example, you put GABA blockers, you block inhibition, or you reactivate inhibition stronger, like in sleep, the network goes into a state of sleep in the computer. You can easily shift the state by manipulating certain parameters that we know are, re are related to sleep versus non-sleep and so forth. And yes, so this is one brain state, epileptic seizure. We can make the system, as I showed you very briefly, into a state of epilepsy. So yes, brain, it's not a, it's not a static circuit because if you change parameters in the macro circuit level, synapses and neuron types, then the macro level, the, the behavior becomes a new state. Many, many new states. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aidan. I, I have to say that uh, uh, we have uh, some time open for discussion at the end of the, of the day in a round table. And our intention is to, uh, let's say, catch up with uh, some of the, the questions that remain open during this, uh, this question and answer sessions. So this is, uh, this is direct to, to the people whose question we cannot uh, address directly because of the time limitation. Please bear in mind that at the end of the day, we, we may, uh, let's say, catch up with these uh, pending times. Okay, thank you very much, Aidan, for your kind participation in the meeting. Welcome. And now,